This video is about tracking African birds. It's a guide to for bird foot structure and typical tracks. Birds are designed to stand on their toes and do not place their whole foot on the ground. The toe bones, called phalanges, which form each toe, are connected to a length of bone raised off the ground called a tarsometatarsus, which is part of the foot. This bone is part of the foot and connects the toes to the tibiotarsus, which is part of the lower leg. The tarsometatarsus only touches the ground when the bird is resting or lying on the ground. This foot structure is in essence quite similar to that of a cat, which also walks on its toes in a plantigrade fashion and does not place its whole foot on the ground. No bird has more than four toes. Many ground birds have only three toes touching the ground with much reduced raised or absent first toes, um, also called hind toes, while the ostrich has only two toes, which is referred to as dilatal. Each toe is made of phalanges or toe bones, the number of which is dependent on the position of a specific toe on the foot. Each set of phalanges ends in a claw on the distal end of the foot, that's the outer end, which may be sharp or blunt depending on the type of bird, its habits and the function of the claws. Toes are numbered from 1 to 4 from the inside of the foot to the outside. The number of phalanges on each toe are 1, 2, 3 and 4 respectively as one goes from the inside to the outermost toe. Birds with four toes tend to have the first toe pointing backward while toes 2, 3 and 4 point forwards. If you look at the diagram here, the first toe is the hallux uh, which points backward. It has one phalange or toe joint. The first metatarsis is part of the foot structure and it's not counted as a phalange. Then on the second toe you have two phalan phalanges, on the third toe three phalanges and on the fourth toe four phalanges. Birds with three toes have all their toes pointing forward and they are numbered two, three and four. The first toe has been lost since it is a disadvantage to ground birds with a cursorial or running habit to have a third, uh, fourth toe. In some birds, the hind toe may be reduced, absent or raised off the ground so that it may not show in the track. Here we have the tracks of a thick knee, also called a dukop in southern Africa. Uh, you can see there are three toes on each foot and the middle toe is of course the longest. And there's no, obviously no hind toe shown in the tracks at all. Birds may have partial or full webbing extending between the toes. And the webbing may extend only between the front three toes, two, three, and four, which is called palmate. Or the webbing may extend to the hind toe, two, which is referred to as toady palmate. Toe, toe arrangement typical in cormorants, darters, boobies, and pelicans. Partial webbing is referred to as semi-palmate or palmate and is found in birds like the pied avocet. Some birds may have lobe feet such as the coot and the African finfoot and is referred to as lobate which they use for swimming. Here you have uh, webbing of uh, various birds and the various kinds of webbing. Uh, in an in isodactyl foot which is four toes, um, the three front toes are webbed only and that is an example of a palmate toe structure. Toti palmate is where you have webbing that goes through all the fingers. Semi palmate is where you have partial webbing on the foot and then lobate is where you have lobes of webbing on the foot. So if you look at the, the bottom pictures you have the typical duck's foot. Uh, pelicans and terns also have that um, palmate structure. Then the toady palmate would be pelicans, cormorants, um, birds like that that have all four toes with webbing between them. Semi palmate birds would be uh, the avocet, for example, and this is uh, the toes of an avocet. You can see that they're partially webbed. And then lobate would be the, something like a coot, where you can see the lobes on the foot. The ostrich has only two toes, which are third and fourth toe, the third and fourth toe of the foot. The number of toes has been reduced for the purpose of running, as the surface area of the foot affects the time on the ground and therefore friction, which affects the bird's speed. The smaller of the two toes, the fourth toe, which is on the outside of the foot, 
is used for balancing or to stabilize the bird when it is walking. The large toe also has a very large and blunt claw, which is used for traction when running and for defense. The large toe, incidentally, once again is the third toe. The third toe is always the longest toe in all birds. So yeah, you have some other foot structures uh, without webbing. Uh, the anosodactyl structure, which is um, a hind toe with three forward pointing toes. Zygodactyl, which is the first and fourth toe backwards and second and third forward. Heterodactyl, first and second backwards and third and fourth forward. Syndactyl, where the second and third toe are partially fused near the base. And then pamperodactyl, where all the toes point forward. In terms of the length, the middle or third toe is the longest in all birds, followed by the fourth second and first toe respectively. In birds that have four toes on each foot, there are a number of arrangements of the toe positions relative to one another, depending on the species of bird. Of course, the four toes is the anisodactyl. In birds such as mouse birds, family Collidae, and the swifts, Apodidae, the first toe is flexible enough to be forward pointing, giving a foot structure referred to as pamprodactylus. The mouse birds scramble through bushes and are able to move their first toe through a range of positions, forward and back, to enable it to move around. The swifts use their pamprodactylus foot structure to cling to or hang from their nests or cliff faces when feeding chicks or constructing the nest. Here you have a, an image of um, mouse birds and you can see the right hand mouse bird is displaying the pamperodactylus foot structure. So all the toes are pointing forward. It's rotated its hind toe to the front and it's hanging from the branch like that. Whereas in the left hand um, image of the bird, um, you'll see that it's using its claws in a, a different toe structure. It's either anisodactyl, which is evident in, the, in its left claw, where one toe is pointing backward, or um, zygodactyl, where two toes are pointing forward and two back on the right foot of the left bird. Bird foot structure. In other birds, the first and fourth toes are rotated backwards to give a foot structure referred to as zygodactylus. This is typical in barbets and woodpeckers of their peaky forms, um, that's the order which use the hind two toes to stabilize and support their bodies, sometimes aided with the tail when they stand on trunks. It's useful for uh, when, the, when the birds spend long periods scrambling on tree trunks to feed or to construct their nest holes. Owls also have this foot structure, which is presumably useful for grasping rodent prey and for perching. You can see the owl image on the left there. Parrots and woodpeckers have this toe structure, and ospreys and tarancos can also rotate the fourth toe backward to produce this toe structure. So there you have a skeleton of a parrot showing the toe structure, and then of course the woodpecker with two forward pointing toes and two backward pointing toes. Bird foot structure, as far as the trogons is concerned, trogons are exclusively um, heterodactyl. In other words, neither birds have a heterodactyl foot structure. The first and second toe are rates rotated backwards, with the third and fourth toe pointed forwards in, in the foot structure referred to as heterodactyl. So um, heterodactyl, the first and second toe are pointed backwards, whereas zygodactyl, the first and fourth toe, would be pointed backwards. Now you can see the Narina trogon, a Paloderma narina, which is a southern African bird, of course, with a bright red belly, a dark green back and, and head and neck. Uh, it has a heterodactyl foot structure, and it's the only bird in the region that has that foot structure. In most birds, particularly the passerines, that have four toes with three pointing forward and the first toe called the hallux pointing backward, the foot structure is referred to as anisodactyl and is typical of perching birds. Rollers, kingfishers, and hornbills share this toe structure, with the exception that the second and third toes are partially fused together at their lower or proximal ends in a condition known as sand. Here we have a tridactyl foot structure, typical of ground birds such as thick knees and courses. Um, the foot is moving from the right to the left, um, so it's, it's pointing towards the left. You can see the three toe structure. So what do you birds use their feet for? 
Birds use their feet for a number of different purposes, with some feet being adapted for very specific purposes, depending on the species of the bird. They might use them for locomotion, such as walking, hopping, climbing and scrambling, swimming, paddling, skipping on water, for example, storm petrels. Perching, um, most birds, particularly pastrons, are a good example of perching birds, where they use their, their feet to perch on um, objects. Near pastrons and other birds might also be able to perch, depending on the species. Clinging or hanging, this is typical in mouse birds and swifts, and also woodpeckers peckers and barbets, so they would be hanging from an object with their feet. Carrying, uh, fish eagles, ospreys, etc. carry fish, um, prey, which they've caught uh, in their claws or talons. Uh, a bird might carry nesting material also in its feet. Flying, um, birds use their feet um, in the act of taking off, landing, and also breaking on water in the case of ducks. Feeding, uh, parrots grasp fruit for manipulation using their feet during feeding. Um, raptors also uh, grab their prey uh, and while they are tearing flesh from their, their prey when, whilst, whilst feeding. Foraging, uh, a lot of birds scratch on the ground, in the case of ground birds, uh, or they disturb leaves in case of thrushes in order to find their prey, their insect prey or seeds, depending on the species once again. Reproduction, egg manipulation in the nest is done with the feet. Incubation of the eggs with the bottom of their feet occurs in gannets and boobies from the family Sulidae, or on the top of their feet in the case of penguins, such as the emperor penguin. So they support the egg on the top of the feet to keep it warm from, from the ice that they're standing on, and then of course use their belly as well to, to warm the eggs for incubation. Nesting, um, feet are used for the construction of nests and the transport of material, of course, it's same as with carrying the material. Courtship, running on water, uh, great crested greaves is part of the courtship or run on water. Hopping and other activity uh, might also be involved, involve the legs and that's also used for courtship. Preening and cleaning, birds may use their feet for scratching at parasites such as bird lice and preening of their feathers. Some birds have modified their longest central or third toe into a preening comb, for example, the bar barn owl and the herons and nightjars. Heat regulation. Herons, gulls, petrels, storks and ducks and geese may cool themselves in this way. Marabou st storks are known to urinate down their legs to cool themselves, leaving their legs stained white with urates. What to look for when tracking birds? Bird activity can be determined by track and sign that they leave in their environment. Tracking birds is not really the same process as in tracking other animals, since birds are able to fly and therefore cannot realistically be followed based on their track and sign. There are obvious exceptions, of course. For example, penguins, ostriches, emus, cassowaries, and many ground birds can be tracked and followed on the ground. And in the case where they can fly, they will tend to fly off a short distance when disturbed if they are ground birds. They will generally burst out of hiding, flapping their wings vigorously for a fast takeoff before gliding to a safe distance on the ground or to a tree. Other things in terms of looking for um, signs for tracking birds. Although one cannot follow a flying bird, tracking of birds is useful in determining their habits and also in determining the habitat areas that they frequent. Such information is becoming particularly useful for ecologists and behaviorists or ethologists in their study of wildlife. So what is the difference between track and sign? Tracks are the traces, footprints, body prints and bill impressions that the animal may leave on suitable substrate due to their activity. A suitable substrate might be sand, fine sand, dust, silt, mud or clay. Sign is everything else that a bird may leave behind to show it was there. Sign might include nest constructions, nest holes in trees, for example barbets and woodpeckers, holes in embankments and burrows, for example blue swallows, pied kingfishers, white-fronted bee-eaters, feeding signs such as partially eaten fruits and nuts, pecking marks on trees, pecked off bark chips, feathers, eggshells, droppings, partially eaten prey such as chameleons, small antelope, fish and also and also owl pellets regurgitated with the bones, teeth and hair of the rodent prey that they swallow whole. Birds have characteristic feather colours and patterns that can usually lead to a positive identification of the bird 
or at least identification to a specific group of birds. Um, other ways to identify cyan, uh, many birds have characteristic eggs with characteristic colors, sizes, patterns, shapes and, mark pat and markings. Bird skeletons and skulls can often be used to give immediate identification in the field of a bird species that may have been killed by a predator. Some birds have characteristic droppings, and all bird droppings can be identified as such by the combination of the dropping and the white urates that stay in the dropping, since birds, like reptiles, urinate and defecate from the same opening called the cloaca. Although reptiles also have a white stain in their droppings, lizards will usually have a white cap on a lozenge-shaped dropping, which separates their droppings from those of Crocodile droppings are very large patches of mostly white material, and the contents are indistinguishable since they have strong digestive systems that can digest even hair and bones. Bird droppings often have signs of their dietary habits. For example, seeds and droppings stained by fruit in starlings, bulbuls, and many other birds may be evident. This can help with identification of the bird. Perches, roosts, including areas beneath them, and termite mounds or boulders also often have bird droppings, which show bird activity. Many birds are insectivorous and may therefore leave droppings with insect exoskeletons encrusted in them. Bird nests are very diverse and oftentimes their shape and structure is very particular to a species and easily discerned, although there may be cases where the identification can only be attributed to a specific group or group of birds. It therefore pays the track to learn about bird nest types. Here we have an example of bird sign. Um, vulture scat has stained this fur carcass. Um, see all the white in the carcass that you see is from vultures. There's also a feather and some more scat on the right hand picture. Uh, all the little black spots that you see in the image of the hippo on the ground and on the body are flies. Identification of tracks or spur. In accordance with the foot types of birds that we have already discussed, bird tracks or spur can be classified in several different groups based on these foot structures. They can also be grouped according to the gait, i.e. either hopping or walking. Once again, the primary groups are anisodactyl, syndactyl, didactyl, tridactyl, zygodactyl or heterodactyl, pamperdactyl, webbed palmate, webbed totipalmate, webbed semipalmate and webbed lobed. So those are all the uh, primary groups of uh, foot structures. Things to look for when identifying tracks of spur, the number of toes, uh, or toe count, two, three, four toes, um, remember there are never more than four, toe shape, track pattern, claw marks, orientation of the toes, a reference to the foot structure, orientation of the hind toe, also called the hallux of first toe, in isodactyl tracks, number of phalanges on each toe, particularly if the substrate shows fine detail, signs of webbing or lobing, walking, running or hopping gait, as this can provide clues for identification, so looking at the gait of the animal, stride length and straddle width, track or spur size, length and width, body, body bill, feather impressions and scrape marks or holes, for example guinea fowl. So here we have uh, an example where you could use toe count and toe shape for determining the track, so this is a three-toed track, of a decorpothicne uh, with some porcupine tracks and uh, blackback jackal tracks in, in the top part of the image. Um, so you'd look at the toe count and the toe shape. They have a distinctive boat shape, so that would be one reason why you'd look at the toe shape. Here we have a guinea fowl track, and you can see um, here the claw marks might be important and the shape of the toes. Note the claw mark at the back of the hind, um, which shows a hind toe, and um, that's all that's showing. So there would be a very small sign and wouldn't always be uh, evident in it. Here we have webbing, a semi palmate webbing track of um, a homocorp, scope of some retta. Here we have toe orientation and position of the hallux of thumb, it's uh, slightly angled from the middle toe and um, that could be a clue as to what kind of it is. Then once again you can measure, measure the stride length and also the straddle width. Um, these are ostrich tracks by the way. 
and um, that and the size of the tracks themselves can give you clues as to the bird um, type or at least very the groups of, of, of birds it might belong to. And now the sedactyl tracks or square, the orientation of the hind toe, also called the first toe or hallux, is very important for identifying birds. The first toe orientation relative to the middle or third toe is very important. Uh, the first toe is either directly in line with middle or third toe, which is the case with most passerines and some other anosodactyl birds such as the black eagle. The first toe might be at an angle to the orientation of the middle or third toe. Examples would might be with storks, the cape vulture, the secretary bird, crop, crows, guinea fowl, franklin, domestic chicken, doves and pigeons, etc. Or the first toe will be parallel to the middle or third toe, but offset. Um, and this is classic for herons and eagles. In raptors, um, in addition to the usually diagonal first toe position, raptors will also show very large claw marks in their tracks, which obviously the claws are used to subdue their, and kill their prey. Here we have examples of syndactyl tracks, where the second and third toe are slightly fused at the base, and it's typical of hornbills, rollers, kingfishers. Tridactyl tracks are spur. Yeah, the bird spur uh, don't show any signs of the hallux or first toe. Only the second, third, and fourth toes are visible. Things to note, birds with this track will either have no first toe, or the first toe is much reduced in size, raised too high on the bird's foot to make an impression in the track, or the first toe may simply not have made an impression due to the nature of the substrate. For example, the substrate is too hard, or the hind toes stood on a small stone or twig and therefore did not mark as an impression. Be careful to look for very small impressions of the first toe or claw of the first toe that you may have overlooked. Birds in this group include the blue-crowned and wattled cranes, bustards and corons, African black oyster catchers, spotted and watered bicrops, lapwings of the genus Pinellus and corsairs. Ducks, geese, flamingos and gulls also fall in this category, although they have webbed footing. Note that the webbing may or may not show, and also that ducks and flamingos do have first toes, but they do not always show. Tridactyl tracks once again, uh, we've seen an image of this before. Zygodactyl or heterodactyl tracks, two toes forward, two toes backwards, are characteristic of this track type. The orientation of the toes is not symmetrical, so the track impression is more like a letter K than a letter X. The most common birds to display this track, partly because of the size of the tracks, makes them more obvious are the owls. Make, sorry, making them more obvious are the owls. These tracks will seldom show for more than one to three meters on a track sequence before the bird flies off. Often these tracks may begin with a body impression, particularly in fine dust or in deep snow where an owl has stuck, uh, struck its prey. Here we have a zygodactyl track sequence of an owl. The typical K structure is evident there. Okay, it's going basically from the left to the right. Um, and notice that the, the slightly more obvious and darker impressions are the right foot. The less obvious impressions are the left foot. Okay. Trogons are heterodactylous and are forest birds. Um, they spend a lot of their time in the trees and are boreal perch and weight feeders. So they feed mostly on insects, arachnids, various lizards and chameleons. Their tracks, which are heterodactyl, are therefore unlikely to show on the forest floor, where the leaf-covered substrate is also not likely to show their tracks clearly. They are, however, known to migrate seasonally out of forest areas into the savanna and other habitats. They are also known to occasionally swoop down to the ground to take a lizard or some other prey item. So their spur might well appear to the lucky and observant tracker. Mouse birds can orientate their toes into a zygodactylous configuration, and their tracks have been observed on the ground, although they feed on leaves and on fruit only, so it is possible to find them on the substrate. They are likely to go to the ground for dust bathing or perhaps even anting. Ground woodpeckers and red-throated rhinex are likely to show the spur on the ground because they tend to feed on the ground. Other woodpecker species are more, more arboreal in nature, preferring to feed on insect grubs that they pick, peck out of the tree bark and crevices, drawing them out with their raspy tongues. 
they are far, therefore far less likely sh to show the spore on the ground. However, that is not always impossible. Bennett's woodpecker is one exception in that it may spend up to 70% of its time foraging on the ground, unlike most other woodpeckers. In the didactyl tracks, um, the only culprit, of course, is the ostrich. And the spore is unmistakable with two toe impressions, um, third and fourth toe, the third toe being much larger than the fourth toe, and um, having a very, very large blunt nail or claw, which is used for traction and for defense. Um, note that the fourth or outer toe is used for balance. Webbing. The kinds of tracks that show webbing have already been discussed. It's sufficient to note that these tracks are likely to be encountered most often on beaches, at the sea, and in muddy substrates beside or even visible within the clear waters of lakes, the shallow clear waters of lakes, rivers, pans, waterholes, and pools. Toti palmate tracks are always going to have four clear, clear toes, whereas the palmate tracks will tend to show three toes, the first toe absent or not visible in square. Semi palmate tracks are unlikely to show their webbing easily and usually have three toe imprints. Lobate tracks are typical of coots, grebes, and African finfoot. The red knob coot has four toes in its track. The African finfoot has a reduced and elevated hind toe, which is therefore not likely to show in the square. Grebes have a reduced and elevated hind toe too, and although it is lobed, it will not show in the square. And that's the end. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to the Wilderness channel. Um, and we look forward to giving you more videos like this.